Hello, friends. I don't know. There's no good way to start this video. I, I finished Iron Widow. Uh, let's talk about it now. This is the introduction song. It's not very good, but it's not too long. My thoughts on Iron Widow are all over the place, but that's largely because Iron Widow, the book, is all over the place. Like, I've been meaning to get to it for several years, because the author is also a YouTuber. Their name is Shiron J. Zhao, and they seem pretty chill. You know, I'm not that familiar with their work on YouTube, but they seem smart, and I'm glad that one of us is getting tr published traditionally because, like, the reason that YouTuber books have such a bad reputation is because so many of them are self-published drivel that would never get past, like, actual editors with standards. But this one did. And while my thoughts on Iron Widow are kind of all over the place, I'll say right up front that it is way, way better than most other YouTuber books in terms of quality. But I I've still got plenty of criticisms, you know? It it's a young adult novel, and it's probably the best young adult novel I've read this entire year, but part of the reason for that is that it is very atypical for that genre. You know, you hear young adult fantasy, you get a very specific idea in your mind. I myself have made videos complaining about that slash making fun of that in the past, uh, but again, this is way different. It does some interesting and unique stuff, but it also does some things that you can see coming from a mile away. You know, like, I, I'll get into it as the video goes on, but it's just a weird mashup of things I haven't seen before and things I've seen 10 trillion times before. They betrayed me, they didn't keep their promise, they tricked me and I don't care anymore. The first 100 pages of the book are fantastic. I got very few criticisms, very few notes on it, just they're great. I love the first 100 pages. You could honestly just cut it off right there and maybe tweak it a little bit so it makes a better ending and just then end it right there, and I would have no complaints, because the first 100 pages is basically just a very good novella. It keeps going, though, and after that, uh... Well... So the story is about a girl named Wu Zetian. Uh, she's a teenage girl living in a kingdom called Huaxia, which is in a different world, but it is largely based on Chinese culture. And before anyone says anything, yes, I am aware that Chinese culture has changed a lot over the many centuries that it has been around, but the author is more familiar with that sort of thing than I am, and I would wager she's they are more familiar with it than a lot of the rest of you are. So I'm not going to go in on them and say anything like, oh, this seems inaccurate or anything like that. Just I'm going to defer to their judgment there. And in Huashia, the humans are at war with these giant alien bug things called Hundunes, and the way that they fight back is by using Hundun husks, which are made of this material called, they call spirit metal, to build giant robots. Okay. Now, these robots are called chrysalis, uh, chrysalises, that, is that the plural? <laughs> Whatever. The, the robot is called a chrysalis, and they're each piloted by two people, a man and a woman. But the women are just concubines for the pilots, and they're basically just glorified batteries. You know, they get their chi drained until they die. It's kind of like Darling in the Franks, but with less anime bullshit. There's still some anime bullshit, there's just less of it. Anyways, before the story begins, Zetian's older sister went to go be a concubine for a pilot, and she died. The pilot killed her. So Zetian has decided she's also going to become his concubine so that she can get close to him and then kill him in revenge. And that's basically the first about 25% of the book. And again, it, it's great. It's genuinely great. We see Zetian's toxic home life, her toxic family dynamic. We understand how her sister was the only light in her life because Zetian is very much, you know, property. Her parents bound her feet when she was a young child, which leaves her disabled, which if you're unaware, feet binding was a thing in China up until like about 100 years ago. It basically, they would just break their feet and then bind them with cloth or ropes to make sure that they grew in wrong. And it, it again, it's a real thing that happened. They did it because they thought it would make their pussies tighter. And I know that sounds like I'm making a vulgar joke at their expense, but no, that's really why they did it. You can look that up if you don't believe me. Disgusting! Zetian was beaten and otherwise abused a lot. And it's largely because, well, she's a girl. You know, she's there to be sold off to a husband one day so that she can pop out babies and do housework for him. And Zetian knows killing a pilot, like if she goes through with this plan and kills the pilot that killed her sister, the rest of the, her family will be put to the death as well as her, but she's doing it anyways. And there's a moment right before she leaves 
where she thinks that if her parents give her one reason not to do it, one reason not to go through with it and get them killed as well, then she'll change her mind and they don't. They are cruel to her right up until the end. Zetian is... she's a very angry character. I think that is the best way to describe her in a short sentence. Like, she is angry and that defines her more than anything. There is a deep, deep rage buried inside her. Uh, just rage at society, at her family, at the pilot who killed her sister, and even at herself because she feels like she's not strong enough to resist anyone. And again, she's literally disabled. She can barely walk, so that adds on top of it. And the main driving force of the book is how she utilizes that rage to try and forge her own path in the world, no matter the consequences. Z Zetian is not always a likable protagonist, but she is always interesting to watch, and I understood almost every action she took. You know, she, she is fleshed out enough that, and it, the book doesn't make excuses for her when she does something shitty, so whenever she does something shitty, I was like, I understand why you did that. I, I don't think I necessarily like you for doing that, but I, I get it. And she is by far the best part of the book. And that's a large part of why the first hundred pages work so well, is because that's almost entirely just focused on her. But then after that, it starts to branch out more and the other parts of the book are weaker. Because after the first hundred pages, she, get this, you're, you're, you're never going to guess what happens. She turns out to have really strong chi, so she gets to become a chrysalis pilot. And she gets to help fight the Hoondoons. I'll bet you didn't see that coming. And from that point, the book has a lot more ups and downs. Because it's less focused than the original Revenge Quest. And it also doesn't have that much mecha action, which is disappointing. You know, it's really just... When she first becomes a pilot, we see some, and then the climax of the book, we see some. But there's not a whole lot in the middle, which is disappointing because I wanted to see more mecha action. <laughs> that stuff is fun. The middle part of the book is largely just about a love triangle and Zetian getting used to her new life as a pilot, because pilots are celebrities in this world. Uh, right up until the climax, when things get shifted around a little bit. And it's hard to get into details of what worked and what didn't work without spoilers. So that's gonna have to go in its own section. And for a few minutes here, I'm just gonna go over it, things in broad terms. I really liked seeing Chinese culture in a fantasy novel. It's not uncommon to see some culture that's vaguely based on Chinese culture or mythology in fantasy, but it's often very, very surface level. You know, they'll have a few names, some weird clothes, and maybe one or two Chinese terms, but there's not really an exploration of who these people are and what they're like. And so it's nice to see in Iron Widow this sort of thing is explored in a much deeper and more authentic way. I, I'll, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but I am glad that the book embraces the unpleasant parts of Zetian's personality. The book explains why she does what she does, and we the audience understand why she does what she does, but it doesn't try to justify it. When she does something horrible and unpleasant, it's horrible and unpleasant, and you don't necessarily have to like or agree with her when she does it. And in a world of anti-heroes that can't commit to being anti-heroes, cough, 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 remember that? Uh, it's nice to see someone who isn't afraid to make their protagonist kind of a bitch sometimes. And Xiron, Xiron Zhe Zhao was not afraid to make their protagonist kind of a bitch sometimes. Like, let this be a lesson to all writers of all stripes. You can get away with your heroes being dicks if you don't try to justify it. There's been a lot of great stories over the years that have had heroes that are dicks, but the reason that they work and aren't just pure wish fulfillment is because the story doesn't try to justify it. I also like mecha stuff. Like, I, I know it's dumb, but it's fun. Shut up, bitch! <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> it's a lot of fun. You know, the idea of 80 meter tall machines made of magic metal that can shoot lasers and crush these alien bug things that are trying to wipe out humanity. Like, I... I like that. That's a lot of fun. What, what do you want? Just, just, just sue me. I wish there was more of it, but what's there is kind of fun. The descriptions throughout this whole book, though, they need, they need a lot of work. Like, Xiron Zhe Zhao seems to be an underwriter, which means they just don't put a lot of description in their scenes. You know, like, you've probably read some books that feel kind of underwritten, where they'll just go, a man stood in the doorway, whereas other writers might say something like, a man stood in the doorway, he had a red beard covering half his face, he was nearly as tall as the frame, and he had arms bigger around than my legs. You know, like, one of those examples paints a much more vivid picture. And I'm not saying that uh, one style or the other is inherently better or worse, but when the whole book is written with very little flair or detail or even emotion, it starts to drag. You know, that that's why the 
beginning section of the book is so much better is because a lot of it is just in Zetian's head and she's a compelling character and she's not really describing the scenes around her as much so that that's why it works but once it becomes more about the world around her it starts to fail. When it comes to description there need to be peaks and valleys you know parts with very little description and parts with a lot in order to emphasize big moments or big themes big emotions you know things like that because I still don't have a very good idea of what the Hundun's are supposed to look like and they're the villains so Overall, I think that one more draft would have helped a lot here. And without going into spoilers yet, I just want to say that there's a very weird mixture of things that are fresh and things I have seen 10,000 times before, you know? It's a young adult novel, so there's a love triangle, but then it resolves in a very strange way. You know, it's a, again, a young adult novel, so the protagonist has to have more magic or spirit energy than anyone else. They have to have the best powers because they're the protagonist. But she's also disabled. And she doesn't get magically healed or anything. She's genuinely just disabled. She can barely walk and she has to learn how to live with that. There isn't a subplot where she has to rescue a loved one. She genuinely despises all of her surviving family. So th there's just, you know, there's a lot of both here. A lot of stuff I've seen before, stuff I haven't seen. And it's kind of weird to go back and forth on all that. Like, I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying it's weird. So... Overall, before I get into spoilers, do I recommend Iron Widow? It's hard to say. <laughs> it really is hard to say. Like, if it sounds interesting to you, then check it out and decide for yourself. Because this book is honestly so idiosyncratic that I can't predict how anyone else is going to feel about it. If you hear the setup for the story and it sounds stupid to you, then probably just give it a pass because I don't think anything here is going to change your mind. But for all the bad slash annoying slash stupid stuff here, I, it has a truly great protagonist, I'll give it that. And I think Shiran J. Zhao, they are not an amazing writer right now, but I see a lot of potential for them. And if they continue working on this and polishing their craft, then I think they will be a truly great writer one day. And I want to see that happen. So I hope they continue doing this. I hope they continue getting books published and I hope they continue getting better. And that's about it. Let's go to spoilers now. Unlikely things for a cricket commentator to say. The Indians may have pipped us here, but let's not forget, we slaughtered them in their millions. <laughs> okay, once again, there's not really a good place to start with the spoiler section, because I just this book is kind of all over the place. So I suppose I'll start with the love triangle, right? So in the middle is Wu Zetian. And then she has one friend in her home village. It's a rich boy named Yiji. He's about her age. And when she's leaving to be a pilot concubine, he actually tries to buy her from her parents. Because, again, he thinks, he, he knows she's going off to die. And he thinks that by marrying her, or at least taking her on as a mistress or something, that will save her life. So it's clear he does genuinely care about her. But, you know, she just brushes past him and goes on to try and kill the guy that killed her sister. And then she becomes a concubine. She does kill the guy who killed her sister. And she's going to get executed, but then people see how powerful she is, so they decide to make her a pilot. She's not the first woman pilot ever, but there's not very many of them. And she gets partnered with a guy named Li Shimin, who is supposedly a hardcore serial killer and alcoholic. But he's actually an okay guy. Yeah! So now Zetian has to choose between two hunky boys. Except she doesn't really have to choose because for whatever reason, Yiji makes it clear that he doesn't mind sharing. Like, he tells her, yeah, you can do things with Shimin. It's implied to be like, you can have sex with him and I won't be upset with you. And that situation goes on for a little bit. And then Shimin and Yiji kiss each other. And I guess they're all in a bisexual polycule now. So... Deciding to resolve the love triangle via a polycule is not a bad idea, but it does come completely out of nowhere in the book, you know? it, And it also feels like it's different just for the sake of being different. We didn't spend a whole lot of time with Zetian feeling genuinely uh, torn between the two boys, you know? She's not sitting there going, oh, who will I choose? How can this problem be fixed? It didn't seem like there was a problem. You know, and until, oh, hey, look, they're, they're all fine being in a polycule now. So the solution is given to us before we even realize that there is a problem. It's, it just is odd and told in a strange way. Like, I feel weird saying this, but I kind of wish they had focused more on the love triangle because <laughs> if it's going to be there, then you should spend time developing it. 
It's also just weird that the boys would be accepting of this sort of arrangement, because yeah, Shimi and Yiji are decent guys, but they're still young men who are raised in an extremely conservative and misogynistic culture. Even in one that was uh, accepting of bisexuality or homosexuality, this sort of arrangement would be very out of place, because this is a society where wives are 100% the property of their husbands. They're, they're baby-making machines. That's all they're there for. So two men raised in that society, even progressive men in that society, probably wouldn't just shrug and say, okay, I'm willing to share. Now, that said, Lee Shimin, the one who's supposedly a serial killer and they basically partner uh, Zetian up with him as punishment, he has an actual backstory explaining why he's not a misogynist, and it is weird. So, he wasn't framed or anything. He did actually kill his whole family. He, I guess he's more like a spree killer than a serial killer, but whatever. He, he did kill his whole family, but it was for good reason. So basically, he is half Han, which is Chinese, and half Rongdi, and the Rongdi are nomadic people who live on the periphery of Huaxia. And he had a crush on a girl, so his brothers gang-raped her, which he witnessed part of, and his dad was fine with it too. And then the girl got drowned by her family because she was dishonored now. And there was no chance of justice being done for this, so Shimin just killed his family. And he would have been executed, but he had so much chi that they made him a pilot instead. And again, they, they know that making someone a pilot, they're gonna die pretty soon anyways. We may as well get some use out of him. And that's the story of why he's not sexist. What the hell was that? Okay. Where do I start with that? Um, I guess I'll start with, it's really weird that this girl got gang raped and murdered, but the story is still told in a way that centers Shimin as the ultimate victim. Like, I'm not saying he didn't suffer here. Having something horrible like that happen to one of your loved ones, at the hands of your other loved ones especially, yeah, that would be horrible. But he's not the main one that suffered in that scenario. I, I, I don't know. I feel like this was done as, like, an excuse to make it clear that, oh yeah, Zetian and Shimin, they can just get along from pretty early on after they meet. Not right away after they meet, but pretty early on he tells her that story and then she realizes, okay, I don't need to be afraid of this guy or hate him. He seems fine. And I, I just feel like it'd be better if the two of them genuinely didn't get along at first and they connected because both of them are outcasts. You know, even within their own families, they're outcasts. I also dislike this plot point because Shimin is, again, he, he's nothing but nice to Zetian from the moment they meet. If he's supposed to be a dark, brooding bad boy, then you can't have him be a nice guy whose only bad actions are perfectly reasonable. Like, or... It, okay, I shouldn't describe someone killing his whole family as being reasonable. Let's say it's understandable why he killed his family. Please don't clip that out of context. Basically, just have the two of them clash a little bit before the romance begins, because otherwise it feels perfunctory. The point of having love interests not get along at first is to add conflict. So, add some actual conflict to the book. Come on, just do it. There's also... A subplot where Yiji's father, a wealthy businessman, blackmails Zetian by forcing her to strip naked on camera and threatening to release the footage if she does anything that he doesn't like. And it's kind of out of place, because this feels like a commentary on revenge porn, but it's just so disconnected from everything else in the story and in this world, and it's barely even mentioned, so I don't know what the point is. You know, we already understand this society is extremely sexist and views women as objects, so this bit isn't adding much. Maybe with some tweaking, you could have made it about how women celebrities are all very over-sexualized, but that also would have felt kind of out of place because, I mean, I don't know, there's a bit of commentary on celebrity culture in this, but not that much, and it's not really the focus, and I would really rather it stay focused on the other stuff, which is a lot better and more interesting. If you throw in too many small characters and or subplots into your book, then you don't have time to focus on any of them properly, and thus they all suffer. Once again, vigor mortis. And then there is the final act of the story, which... I, I'll give it this. Most of what happens here caught me very off guard. I'll, I'll give it that much. So, basically, most of Huashia believes that girls have to be sacrificed to power the chrysalises because their chi is naturally weaker, with a couple of exceptions, like Zetian. But Zetian and Shimin torture their commanding officer until he admits that's not how it works. Uh, turns out they could have designed the chrysalises so that both pilots share the burden equally, 
but then pilots would have a 50-50 chance of dying in every combat encounter, and they wouldn't be able to convince many people to volunteer, so they decided to just sacrifice girls instead, because they're seen as expendable. The boys are more important. So after getting this confession out of their commanding officer, they also film it, uh, Zetian and Shimin murder their commander, and then plan to release the footage to the public. Uh, and then they launch a big attack against the Hundunes. There's a huge battle. Shimin gets very seriously hurt. Uh, Zetian goes to a nearby tomb where one of their old emperors has been preserved for 200 years after getting infected with a deadly virus. Just roll with me here. I know that feels kind of out of place. It's pretty out of place in the book too, but just, just roll with me here. Uh, so then Zetian wakes up the emperor and they pilot a mech together and she cures him. She gives him some antivirals and then they defeat the Hundunes that are there. And then she also convinces the old emperor to go to the palace with her. And then she releases the confession footage, kills everyone in the palace, including the emperor and her family, like the current emperor, not the one that's piloting with her. Uh, and she declares herself to be the empress of Huashia. And then she goes and tries to heal Shimin, but he's been taken by the gods, who it's sort of implied that they live in this orbiting satellite over whatever planet they're on, because Zetian also realizes that humans are not native to this planet and the Hundunes are just defending themselves. And the gods say, hey, we're holding Shimin hostage. If you act up, we will kill him. And then the book ends. There is a lot going on there. Uh, like I said, there's some anime bullshit here, just not as much as you might think based on the mecha premise. I will start with this. I don't like or agree with a lot of Zetian's actions in this chunk of the book, but I do totally understand why she did them. You know, she's mad at the military for sacrificing so many girls, and she says, no more girls are gonna die, but like, again, it's made clear that someone has to die. They just set it up so that the same people die every time. So I, it's kind of hard to blame them. I feel like they made a really difficult choice, but at the same time, I do totally understand why Zetian is so upset. Like again, that she, is a girl in a society where girls are viewed as objects. I get why she acted the way she did. I get why she murdered her commanding officer, and I get why she decided to take over the entire kingdom. I, I don't... She's not always a likable character, and she's not one that I always agree with. She's just a well-written one. And that's how you should do it. You, you should aim for being well-written over aiming for being likable, at least most of the time. The torture and murder, like, that's a bit much, but again, I understand why she would do that. And when she does her very quick and easy coup, like I said, she, her family is at the palace and she kills all of them. Her parents, her grandparents, and her younger brother. And right before she does that, her parents appear and they beg her to spare her brother. They don't ask her to spare them, they just ask her to spare her brother, like their other child that's still alive. And then she thinks about how they were willing to toss her, sister, her and her sister away like trash, but they actually care about her brother, so she kills them all. And I'll be honest, uh, I'm unsure how I feel about her taking out her anger on her brother, because I don't remember him doing anything to her in the book. I think he was just the beneficiary of their abusive family dynamic. Maybe she should have hesitated a bit more before killing him. Maybe the sequels will go into more guilt uh, that she feels over killing him, but I, I don't know. I, I will say I'm impressed that the author went there. <laughs> you know, Shiran J. Zhao, if you ever see this, Good job! I'm impressed you went there. That's a ballsy move. Because many other stories would have just had Zetian forgive her family for their abuse. And honestly, I would say that overall I love this climax, even if it's kind of disjointed and weird. I would say I loved it if it weren't for the double twist, note the quotes around the word twist, about how humans are the real villains, and also, it's not a fantasy world, it's a sci-fi story. First things first, I have seen both of those twists done a million fucking times. I am woefully tired of them. And every time someone writes one into their story, they seem to think that they're the first ones to do it ever. Stop it, it's annoying. Uh, if you want to make a fantasy story that's really science fiction, then stop treating it like a twist. You know, a lot of other authors have done that. Stuff like uh, the Broken Empire series, which is really good, the characters know from the beginning that, yeah, this is just Earth after a big apocalypse, and the audience knows from very early on that it's Earth after an apocalypse, so it works. Uh, there's also the Dinosaur Lords, where the characters don't know that they're just on another planet that humans colonized, but the readers pick up on it, and we realize that, okay, yeah, all the magic they're seeing is just advanced technology, and 
those aren't actually angels, those are some sort of weird androids. And it works because rather than just being a cliched twist, it introduces mystery to the story, so the audience is pulled in more, like we want to know exactly why things are set up this way. You know, why don't the people know that they are on another planet that was colonized? Why is their level of technology so low? Like, things like that. And there's a little bit of that sort of mystery in Iron Widow, like we're wondering, okay, why are the people of Huashia kept in the dark about the true nature of their world? How and why is their culture so close to pre-modern China? But we also know, at least in broad strokes, why the gods are there, and it's because they want the spirit metal that comes from dead Hundun's. Like, uh, after killing Hundun's, they leave out spirit metal sometimes as offerings, and then the gods will come and pick it up. Like, there's just a lot you could do with this setup, and I would rather them explore that more as opposed to, you know, Zetian adjusting to life as a celebrity and also weird love triangles. For example, the humans here, they're not native to this planet, they're presumably from Earth, so you could have some fun with that. You know, you could describe some of them as looking Chinese, but then others as looking like other races, like white, black, Indian, etc. Like, they would look different, but they all follow the same culture, so they don't really think of themselves as being separate from each other, and it would hint at something kind of unusual going on. Like, I just... I don't know, man. Some of the weirder stuff in this book, I can't really say anything about it. I can just point at it and say, look, that's weird. <laughs> Iron Widow is not a bad book. I don't know if I would call it good overall, but parts of it are good. Parts of it are freaking fantastic. I, I don't have a strong closer to this. Just like I didn't have a strong opener, I don't have a strong closer. Rate the video, comment, and subscribe. I'll, I'll see you next time. Goodbye. Hello there! This is the end of the video, which means all the patron names are gonna be here on screen. My $10 and up patrons are Arthur D. Gonzalez Martin, Brother Santodes, Carolina Clay, Ich Bin Longweilig, Kiana Arms, Lexi Delorme, Liza Rudakova, Lord Tiebreaker, Michael and Katie Hake, Mr. A5013, Proscriptions of Duo Jang, Rovi, Psych XS, Slumbering Jellyfish, Observing Outer Space, Tesla Shark, Toa Michael, Ve Victus, and Wesley. All these people, all the other names, you're all great. Also, shout out to my YouTube channel members who aren't here, but they also get access to things like early access to videos, they get one exclusive video a month, you know, that sort of stuff. It's great. If you feel like doing that, either join Patreon or join the channel. Or just like the video, comment, subscribe to my channel, share it around, make sure it gets to people. Uh, I also have merchandise available, so check some of that out if you're curious. Uh, don't have anything else to add, but, you know, you're all still watching, so I may as well keep talking. Have a lovely day. Goodbye.